Hi everyone, my name is Daryl Payne, CEO of As Good As Gold Australia, and today once again I'm joined by my brother Brian Thank you, Darryl. and partner at As Good As Gold. And today we have a very special returning guest. He is one of the most widely respected voices when it comes to gold and uh, all things about the Federal Reserve. He's the editor of Strategic Intelligence, a financial newsletter. He's the best-selling author of more books than uh, you could imagine. Uh, Aftermath, The Road to Ruin, The New new Case for Gold, Death of Money, Currency Wars, and now and just, re- just released his latest book, The New Great Depression. He's an investment advisor, he's a lawyer, an inventor, and an economist. Uh, and the list just continues, <laughs> doesn't it? I speak, of course, of the one and only Jim Rickards. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Good morning, Jim. Look, uh, it is great to have you back, Jim. It's uh, We were just saying um, prior to this interview, it's been uh, four and a bit years since you were in Adelaide last, a long time between drinks. Uh, we've got a couple of virtual conferences coming up, as you would know, and uh, we're looking forward to having you at, at one of those at least. So uh, thanks very much for your support there too, Jim. Um Okay, there's been a lot of water flowing under the bridge since we hmm. since we spoke last. We've had a pandemic in between. Um, lots of things happening. But what I did want to bring up first up this morning was the gold-silver prices over the last few days. Generally, after an option expiry, we see um, gold-silver prices rebound. That hasn't happened this time. And so we've, we've got gold at around 1700 US, just over 1700 resistance level. We've got uh, silver at just over 26 US, another resistance level. Um, they've been smashed a little over the last month and in, in the last few days where I would have expected a rebound. Can you give us your take on, on what's actually happened there and why this has taken place? Yeah, and this one's actually an easy one. Uh, you know, uh, the price of gold is affected by a lot of factors. Um, some of them economics, some of them geopolitical, some of them just simple supply and demand. Uh, and they all play a role. But but this time there's, there's almost a single factor, and it's almost a one-for-one correspondence, which is interest rates in the United States are going up, and the dollar price of gold is going down. It, it's just that simple. Uh, if you look at a... Uh, when I say interest rates, of course, you, you go over the whole yield curve, a lot of different interest rates, but I'm talking about the U.S. government securities market, the treasury market, basically, and I'm looking at the 10-year, uh, 10-year U.S. treasury, um, the 10-year note, basically, which is our benchmark security. Um, that yield to maturity has gone, if you go back a little further, maybe back to last summer, it's gone from uh, about uh, 80 basis points to uh, about a 1.45%, 145 basis points, if you want to put it that way. So that's a huge leap. This is a uh, market, it always has a certain amount of volatility, but that's a very sharp spike in interest rates. And of course, gold is a form of money, in my view, it's monetary asset, it has a place in every portfolio, but it doesn't have any yield. Uh, it can go up or down, you can make money on it. I expect uh, gold investors will make money on it as the dollar price goes up, but it doesn't have any yield. If you have an ounce of gold, a one ounce gold coin, um, you put it in a drawer, you go away for a year, you come back, you open the drawer, still a one ounce gold coin. It didn't, no dividends, no interest, uh, you know, it didn't multiply. And uh, that's okay, it's a form of money, it's not supposed to multiply that way, but you're competing with other investment classes, other asset classes for the investor dollar. So as the interest rates on the 10 year note go up and they have been going up very sharply, all of a sudden institutions um, say, well, I'm gonna you know, either get out of gold or, and go into treasury notes or, uh, and then once that starts, there's a momentum factor. It only takes a small amount of people doing that, a small, relatively small amount of people <coughs> redeeming, redeeming ETFs um or just not buying them that you know the incremental buyer goes away uh and of course these are leveraged investors in many cases so um if you're on the futures market you close out a a future uh it's really 10 times your money that you're which is a lot of gold that you can control in a small amount of money so as all these things play out you're, you're basically competing with something that's offering a higher and higher yield to maturity, which is what's going on with the tenure note. So if you want to forecast the price of gold, at least in the short run, it's a pretty simple question. 
what is the tenure note going to do? What is the yield to maturity of the tenure note going to be 30 days or 60 days from now? And that will tell you a lot about what the price of gold is going to be. Now, I will say with a lot of uh, a lot to back it up and a lot of conviction that that tenure note yield to maturity is going to turn around, drop very rapidly, and then that's going to mean a spike in the dollar price of gold. You know what goes up, uh, you know will come down or vice versa. So as interest rates are going up, the dollar price of gold is going down. Uh, but by the same token, when interest rates come down, the dollar price of gold is going to go back up. So then the question is, when is the interest rate going to turn around? Yep. Right now, and then you have to say, well, what's driving it? What's the environment? Uh, right now, it's being driven higher on inflation expectations. Now, notice I didn't say inflation. There's no real inflation. We don't have any inflation. But it doesn't matter. If people think there's going to be inflation, then they're going to ask for a higher interest rate on their tenure note. Uh, and right now, people do think there's going to be inflation. Why is that? Because we're, you know, the, the COVID uh, caseload, the, the pandemic caseload, the pandemic fatalities are coming down very sharply. They, they went up uh, enormously over the month of December. They peaked on January 8th. You can see all this in the data. Uh, at that time, on January 8th, the daily increase in the caseload was nine times what it was last March and April. Go back to March and April when this, it didn't hit Australia until later. I got a grant that it hit different parts of the world at different times. You had a very bad outbreak in, in Victoria. Um, they shut down Melbourne, you know, and so forth. And you're, you, you know more about that than I do, although I've watched it closely. Mm. Uh, but at least, at least in the United States, um, we had this, uh, you know, you go back to March and April, quarantine, lockdown, stay home. You know, it wasn't even a question of wearing masks. They didn't even want you to go outside. Uh, but, and it seemed pretty bad. Then in June, we had kind of a reopening, but then that failed. There was a second wave in the summer. Then it got a little bit better in September, October. And then, bam, we got slammed with a third wave in, um, uh, in, in the beginning, late November, December, and January. That third wave, the, case, the daily case was going up nine times faster than it did last spring, nine times. The fatalities were double. The reason, right. the reason there's a different factor between caseload and fatalities was because the treatments were better, more people were surviving, which is a good thing, but it was still much more severe. Now that peaked January and it's tailed up very sharply, which is also to be expected to the point now where it, it seems to be fading. So, so we're rolling out the vaccines, more people have immunity. Um, the, the daily caseload increase is dropping, although I'd watch that space, it seems to be plateauing a little bit. Maybe there's another way, but that's it's too soon to speculate on that. Um, and so people are saying, well, then now the economy is going to reopen. Some of our governors are reopening. They've said, they've said no more restrictions. You know, use your use your common sense, do what you want, but go out. Things are reopening. And then we have a two trillion dollar deficit spending package that's going to pass the Congress probably next week, probably within a week. Uh, and everybody is going to up to a certain income level uh, is going to get a fourteen hundred dollar check. So Wall Street's sitting there saying, "Well, yeah. the, the economy's reopening, the COVID's going away, they're mm. handing everybody a check, pan up demand. This economy is going to roar. That's going to mean inflation, and so bid up the interest rates." Now, everything I just said is wrong, meaning everything everything I said is what people expect. It's an accurate recitation of facts, and it's an accurate description of. Uh, expectations. And it's why the tenure note is going up, which is why gold is going down. None of it is going to play out the way I described. And this is also in the data. When Americans get these checks, and we got a $600 check at the end of December. I didn't personally get one, but my wife got one. A lot of <laughs> millions, of, millions of Americans did. Um, they didn't spend it. They spent part of it, but most of it they right. saved or paid down debt. Now, we have a consumption-driven economy in the United States. 70% of our GDP is consumption. Well, you can print money, and you can hand out money, and you can do deficit spending. But if you give the money to people and they don't spend it, they stick it in the bank, which is what they're doing, you don't get velocity. You don't get inflation. You don't, get the kind of, you don't have the kind of pent-up demand everyone's expecting. And meanwhile, unemployment it seems to be getting worse. We'll know more in a couple yep. of days. Um, so the bottom line on all this is that interest rates are going up in anticipation of inflation based on handouts. The reality is the handouts are not being spent, they're being saved, which does nothing for inflation. And it's also not sustainable, which is what are you going to do? Hand out um, 
a, a two trillion dollar deficit spending package every six months because that's kind of what we've been doing since last yeah. summer. And they keep saying, "Well, this is the last one; it'll be sustainable." It's not sustainable. It's a handout, and people need the money. But if they put it in the bank, which they're doing, this is a classic liquidity trap. So what's going to happen? Yeah. But meanwhile, meanwhile, the interest rates are going up, perhaps for the wrong reason, but they're going up. That's going to slow the economy further. We're already seeing mortgage applications dry up. Uh, we're seeing the housing bubble, not bubble, but pretty steep increase in, the, in residential housing starting to level up. So by, um, you know, hard to say, but I would say by March or April, this whole thing is going to go in reverse. Everything we just talked about is going to go in reverse. The economy is not going to have the traction. Unemployment is going to remain high. Velocity is going to continue to drop. There's not going to be any inflation. Those interest rates are headwind. when they're going to drop and the price of gold is going to shoot up. So my advice to uh, the potential gold investors is uh, it's on sale. Uh, go get some right now. Uh, it's always better to buy low and sell high. And uh, but I would expect the price to be much higher by mid-year. Very good explanation, Jim. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Look, I was going to ask you a couple of questions or uh, just a quick question on interest rates as well. Um, you've already mentioned and we're experiencing the same thing here. I mean, mainstream media and governments are talking this whole exercise up. Um, um, we're in a really good space at the moment, according to Josh Frydenberg, our, uh, our current treasurer. Josh just recently, only yesterday, announced that we'd had a 3.1% uh, increase in GDP over the last quarter, that uh, that followed a 3% adjustment in the GDP in the previous quarter. So not only was he really happy about the fact that this had uh, the GDP numbers had overperformed, but it actually was, um, we, we broke history. We've never had, never had a situation before where we've had in two uh, two quarters, um, three percent or over three percent adjustment increase in right. GDP. So very excited about that. So what you're saying is we're out of recession, um, and, and let's move forward. But I've, I've, my question is this, or my statement first: If we hadn't reduced interest rates, how, how can an economy be in a sound position, which is what we're being told, with interest rates as low as they are in many cases and around the world, around 0%, sometimes some countries in negative. So I know that you've said this before, or I'm pretty sure you've said this before, that to stimulate an economy, you need to reduce interest rates by somewhere around 3 4% to have an effect. When interest rates are currently at zero, how can you do that? I mean, where do you go from zero? Uh, are they out of bullets? Well, a couple of things. Uh, the, the short answer is you can't. You, 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 in theory, you can go to negative rates, but negative rates don't work. We have experience from um, uh, the ECB, uh, Sweden, Japan, Switzerland, and elsewhere that negative rates don't work. They're, they're negative rates, but they don't. It's not more of the same. Cutting rates from 3% to you know, zero has a beneficial effect, but cutting them from zero to negative one, now you're through the looking glass. You don't get any more pop, you don't get any more bang for the buck. And there are reasons for that, which are what, as a central bank, what signal are you sending? Well, see, the idea of negative rates is you're going to spend the money because if I'm going to take it away, you put money in the bank, even at zero, you put money in the bank, you go away for a year, come back, the same amount of money should be there. That's the zero interest rate. But a negative interest rate, negative 1%, you put uh, $100,000 in the bank, you go away for a year, you come back, you only have $99,000. Because I took a thousand dollars, that's one percent negative interest. So the idea is, I'm going to take your money. You're going to spend it fast because you don't want me to take your money, uh, and that's going to have the stimulative effect that we talked about. That's not actually what happens. What happens? Two things. Number one, uh, people have lifetime goals: um, their retirement, their health care, their parents' health care, their children's education, buying a house. There's some large lifetime goal you have, and that's why you save money in the first place. If I'm taking your money away, you're going to save more, not less. You you still you still want to achieve that goal. I've made it more difficult, but you're actually going to save more. They want you to spend it, but now you're saving more. And the second thing is, what signal is a central bank sending when they have negative interest rates? Mm. They're saying that they're worried about deflation, not inflation, mm. but deflation. 
Yeah. So if they're telling me, if Central Bank is telling me that deflation is a problem, I'm going to wait. And why should I buy anything right now? Wait till the price drops. Um, and by the way, a negative interest rate, negative one percent, my example, is a nominal uh, phenomena. But in real terms, if you have deflation, my money is worth more. So even though my dollar amount may be less, my purchasing power went up because prices went down. And so negative, that's why negative interest rates don't work because A, you're sending a deflation mm-hmm. signal. So people defer spending and B, they have lifetime goals. So they actually save more. So negative rates don't work. So you see, so right, you're stuck at zero. There you are. I mean, you can do QE, you can do quantitative easing. Um, and usually what happens is they hand the ball over. I don't know if it's a rugby match or whatever, but they, they hand the ball from monetary policy, which is now impotent, to fiscal policy, which is deficit spending. Uh, but there you have you have other kinds of headwinds having to do with very high, um, very high debt levels. But um, more to the point, uh, in terms of you know what a what a central bank can actually do, uh, they 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 can stimulate. They they can print money, uh, and governments can spend money and incur deficit spending. But again, none of it does any good if uh, if people don't actually spend it. And that's a psychological phenomena. And the Fed or the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, or any central bank can print money, uh, no doubt about it, but they can't change people's psychology. You need, we had an external shock, an exogenous shock in the form of the pandemic that caused people to stop spending, save more, or they were unemployed. Or you know, if you're the unemployed individual, you're, you're not taking your friends out for dinner these days, uh, you're putting money in the bank. And even if you still have your job, um, you're gonna save money because you're worried you might be next. You might be the next one to get laid off or your company might shut down next week or next month. And so you're gonna save more. It's what economists call precautionary savings or you know, in plain English, saving for a rainy day. Um, and that's what's going on. It's going on, going on uh, all over the world. Now, Australia had, you know, every country has different policies, but Australia had a lot of policies that were similar to the United States. They might have different names and different details, that they were basically designed to create a bridge, a, a bridge loan, direct or indirect, from the worst part of the pandemic to whenever we reopen, although query when that's going to be. But um, for example, I know in Australia, you had a moratorium on rent. Uh, basically, people didn't have to pay the rent uh, and didn't have to pay mortgages. Right. Uh, and there, was, there were no foreclosures. We, we, you know, a, a greedy banker couldn't kick you out of your house or a, a landlord couldn't kick you out of your apartment. Yeah. Well, that's the kind of help that people needed. So I'm not, I don't want to argue that policy. I don't want to argue the, the correctness of that. Governments had to do something, and that's one of the things they did. But so when your, your treasurer uh, is out saying, this is the best growth we've ever had, you know, et cetera, et cetera. First of all, just to throw a little cold water on that, and it's, this is true in the United States also, but it is true in Australia, you are not back to 2019 levels of output. You're coming close. You're coming close. You may get there later this year, but as of the end of the first quarter, you are not back to 2019 levels of outputs. That's how bad this recession was, number number one. Number two, that's measuring measuring it based on output, gross domestic product. That is the conventional way of measuring everything. What's missing from that is lost wealth. So let's say I have a restaurant and let's just say it's been around for a long time, good reputation, has a going concern value of $2 million. So somebody at arm's length would pay me $2 million to take over my restaurant. Uh, but my annual income is $200,000. I made a, a 10% margin on this on this business. Well, if you shut my restaurant and then worse than shut, I mean, everyone's like, well, we're going to shut them down. You'll reopen. A lot of people didn't reopen. In, in the United States, maybe Correct. it's meant to Correct. Third, yeah. small and medium-sized business didn't reopen. So now the, now the restaurant's permanently shut. Okay. So GDP dropped $200,000 in my example. But what about the $2 million of lost wealth? Yes. Uh, I've, I've walked away from the lease. I've terminated my employees. They're not getting their jobs back. The, the equipment's up for, at fire sale prices, et cetera. So there's another black hole over here, which nobody's talking about, which is lost wealth. Well, central bankers and mainstream economists will talk all day about the wealth effects. Like, well, we're going to get stock markets to go up. It doesn't put money in your pocket, but you feel richer and you'll spend more. Okay. There's, you know, maybe, maybe not. But the opposite is certainly true. If you destroy wealth, um, people are going to feel poorer. 
and spend less. Now, I know stock markets are back up, at least in the United States, back up to all time highs. I think the Australian stock market is doing pretty well also. Yeah. But that's just the stock market. Uh, when you when you cast a wider net and look at the uh, market value of small, medium sized businesses, that amount of lost wealth will take uh, perhaps a decade or more to recover. And that affects behavior. And that's what the economists don't get. It's what the central bankers don't get. They've got all their statistics and their correlations and the regressions and their models, most of which are out of date, but they don't understand human nature. They don't understand behavior. They don't understand the kind of response that I described to negative interest rates. And they don't understand um, the savings impulse that comes from lost wealth. And so all of that, all of those are major headwinds to the kind of recovery that your treasurer is talking about. This morning, we've talked about uh, inflation and the velocity of money. Uh, that's been your uh, position on what inflation is. And I have to agree with that, uh, the, the inflation, the velocity of money procedures. I just want to give you a story before I ask the statement, because Australia may be different from America, but this is how it is. In Australia, it seems like the roaring 20s. It really does. Australia's housing market is actually going berserk at the moment. And in the US, the stock market seems to be no ending with the prices going up. We have just been advised that fruit and vegetable prices will be going up by 30% in the next six months. Now, in regards to the real estate, I can tell you this is my example of living in a suburb that's 10 minutes from the CBD. So a house next door was sold for $610,000 uh, 610, 18 months ago. A block of land was sold yesterday, or sorry, last week. Uh, the house has to be bulldozed, so I just call it a block of land. But that sold for $805,000. I say, if that's not inflation, what, what do you call it? Because I, I, like to, I really like to know what's happening here. Well, uh, and I've had this debate with others. It's, uh, it's about the definition of inflation. I, when I think about inflation, I think about consumer prices or producer prices or personal consumption expenditures. So that would be, you know, your gasoline, your heating bill, your, your milk and eggs and cheese and food and groceries and clothing and a new computer, basically consumption expenditure. Uh, but, um, but money has to go somewhere. And if it's not going into an increase in consumer prices, it can go into assets. So I would say what you're describing, I don't call it inflation because I do look at, uh, as I say, consumer prices, but it is, um, uh, it's asset inflation, if you want to call it that, or it's or perhaps an asset bubble. Uh, it's, real, it's real money. I mean, I, I take your point. We're seeing the same thing in the United States. Now, you always have to, you know, when you have a question like that, ask yourself five more questions. So why, why are those residential real estate prices going up? And, they, and the same thing's happening in the United States. The answer is that there is an exodus, and I don't think that's too strong a word, out of the cities. People are put off by, I mean, cities mm -hmm. have always been a trade-off. Cities are, okay, you have a lot of noise and some dirt and some hassles and maybe a slightly higher crime rate. But on the other hand, you have art and culture and museums and shows and restaurants and, and, and bars. And so you, you make the trade-off. You say, I'll accept these annoyances in exchange for all this, you know, culture and buzz and cities attract, you know, the brightest people. So whether it's, uh, you know, bankers or lawyers or doctors or artists, playwrights, actors, whatever, uh, it's just, there's a lot of buzz. That's why people go to cities. With these lockdowns, and you had it in Melbourne, and we had it worse, I would say, in, in New York and Los Angeles, we've amplified all the negatives and taken away all the positives. We've shut the museums, the restaurants, the bars, the plays, um, you know, office buildings, things that attract to people. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, again, probably not as bad in Australia as it is here, but crime is on the rise. Murder rate in New York has doubled. Uh, suicide rates across the country have tripled. Um, it's, and that's, that's New York, the suicide rates national. So, um, and the quarantines have, even if you didn't get COVID, uh, if you didn't get it, um, there are still diseases that everyone's getting. I talk about this in chapter five of my uh, book, The New Great Depression. It's my new book about the mental health aspects of this. Um, anxiety, depression, um, suicide rates are up. Drug abuse is up. Alcohol abuse is up. Domestic uh, violence is up. Um, there are all these dysfunctions and a lot of them. And of course, when you have highly concentrated populations, which you do in cities, um, a lot of that's where. So what people are doing 
I say people, it's the people who can afford it. They're getting out of the cities and they're going to nearby suburbs or even further out what we call exurbs, which are, you know, the, the next ring beyond the suburbs. Um, and so there is that demand for housing. I'll, I'll, I'd be willing to bet money that the place you're describing is a pretty attractive neighborhood. It's a place where, where people want to want to go. Yes, it is. Go. Yes, it is. Right. So they're, they're booming. And the same thing's true in the United States. But what's the other side of that? We're depopulating our cities. Cities are the greatest wealth generating uh, phenomena in the history of civilization. I mean, that's what civilization means. It means cities. Um, and so if we're depopulating and draining our wealth creating engine, um, what does that do to the economy long run? So for, as an individual choice, it makes sense and I understand it. But the macro effect is we're depopulating these wealth generating uh, places. I mean, just take any downtown area. It could be Melbourne or Adelaide or Sydney or, or New York for that matter. If, if there's an attractive downtown office building, let's say you're a large company, insurance company, whatever, and you used to have 10 floors as your corporate headquarters. Well, now everyone's been working from home for almost a year. That's that's nothing that anyone would have recommended, uh, you know, a year ago. But we were forced to do it, and guess what? It works. Uh, employers it works, and yeah. employees are finding that hey, it works. You can communicate and get stuff done, and maybe it's, there's some attractions to it. So this work from home thing is here to stay. Uh, what yep. companies will do? They'll say, well, instead of ten floors, I only need two floors, and I'll have attractive offices. But they'll, you'll reserve them. You'll call up and say, hey, I need an office two days next week to meet some clients. Done. They'll build locker rooms. They won't be like high school locker rooms. They'll be very attractive. <laughs> you'll keep your laptop and your sweater and your scarf or whatever in your locker. You'll show up, take your stuff out of your locker. Some receptionists will tell you which office is yours for those two days. Set yourself up, meet your clients, go home and work from home. What does that mean? If you cut uh, commercial real estate capacity or utilization by 80%, uh, we'll start with the cleaning crew and the reception, but what about the food trucks, the restaurants, the shopping, the public transportation, uh, drinks after work, um, you know, on and on and on. All the things that are ancillary to that downtown office location, you cut that by 50 to 80 percent. What is that doing to your economy? So these are examples. And by the way, this will take a year to play out. This is not an overnight thing. Uh, so uh, the tenants are not paying rent. Uh and uh, if, if they are, they've called up and negotiated a 50% increase. There's, I'm, I'm, I have some involvement in commercial real estate, and I, I see this in real time. Um, so rents are down by perhaps half or all the way to zero if they're not paying. And everyone says, well, you know, landlords are rich. No, they're not. The landlords take the rents, but they have mortgages. So if the tenants aren't paying the landlords, the landlords can't pay the mortgagee. Uh, and that falls on the banks right? Yeah. Uh, except the banks are clever. They've securitized it and sold it probably to, to you and me, right? Looking your, look, we have our 401ks, like a superannuation fund, but you look in the fund and do you have some, uh, you know, a commercial real estate uh, REIT or something that Morgan Stanley sold you? Well, maybe you do. And what's inside? No one knows, but take a look. Um, so, but that ripple effect I just described can take a year to play out. So we yeah. haven't seen the end of this. No, right. that's very true. So like I had 400 questions to ask Jim, uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where to go from here. Um, I've, I've just got a, uh, well, it's, not, it's a quick question. I don't know if anything's quick. But um, an Australian economist, Vern Gowdy, just recently, uh, he wrote the book at the end of Australia, and, and you know Vern, of, of course, anyway. But he said, look, there's only one way to ever go broke, and that's to have too much debt. So I just want to focus on debt for a second. Um, during Obama's tenure, 2008 through to 16, um, eight, uh, a debt was level, a debt level at the time was eight trillion, increased to 18 trillion. Donald Trump, of course, suggested that he was going to eliminate the debt over two terms. Well, unfortunately, he didn't get the two terms, but over that four-year period, it went from 18 trillion to 28 trillion. So. You know, the debt levels keep on spiralling and a lot, a lot of governments don't talk about this, of course, and mainstream media don't talk about this. But my question is, we know what's happened to the US dollar and most currencies around the world. Um, I've lost 97, 98% of their value. So they're almost at zero when compared to gold. A gentleman by the name of President de Gaulle, and you'd, you'd recall this, of course, 1965, Vietnam, he said, 
uh, and America has spent a lot of money on the Vietnam War, he said, look, I don't trust gold. Uh, sorry, I don't, <laughs> I don't trust the US dollar. Um, I only trust gold. And he sent a warship to the United States of America um, and did the exchange currency US dollars for gold. Now, that led, of course, to President Nixon doing what he did, taking America off the gold standard. And that created havoc and concern with the populace at large. And so, okay, how much gold does Fort Knox have? Uh, it's no longer backed by gold. We've lost, they've lost confidence in the, in, the, in the US dollar. And of course, from 1973 through 1980, it got both gold and silver went for a huge rip to highest recorded levels. Now, the question I'm going to ask you, Jim, is does it necessarily need hyperinflation or high inflation for gold and silver to soar? Or is it just, sometimes can it happen just through an absolute lack of confidence, as was the case then in the currency being provided? The answer is both. Uh, you, you could see, see, I, I like to say that the gold doesn't change. Gold is, yep. uh, it's an element, atomic number 79 is just gold. What changes is the dollar price of gold. And so when the dollar price of gold is going down, what that really means is that the dollar is getting stronger. When the dollar price of gold is going up, it means the dollar is getting weaker. It takes more dollars to buy the same ounce of gold. So if you use yep. gold by weight, use gold by weight as your as your yardstick, as your your, your measuring device. Uh, when gold, when people say you know gold's going up, I say no, it's not really going up. The dollar is going down, and so you need more yep. dollars for an ounce, and vice versa. So if you want to forecast the um, dollar price of gold, which is what we're talking about, what you're really asking is, will the dollar become stronger or weaker? And going back to your first question, um, you know, can you issue too much debt? Well, it's it's true, but a little tautological that if you if you issue debt in the currency that you print, and that's a big distinction because Argentina always issues dollars, but they can't print dollars. Greece issued right. debt in euros, but they don't print euros. That's a problem because you got to get those euros. But if you yeah. issue debt in a currency that you print, then in theory, you can never and will never default on the debt because you can just print up a bunch of currency and say, here you go. So, yeah. so you have to ask the next question, which is what is the implication? What is the result of printing that much currency? Because you can do it. You can print it and you can pay the debt and um, you're not going to default on the debt that way. But what you will do at some point by printing that much currency, that much money, is destroy confidence in the dollar. And then you can very quickly, very quickly see, we just talked about how velocity is going down and it has been going down, sinking like a stone. If you look at 2020, uh, the, a chart, it, it, it goes down steeply from 2008 to 2019. And then it's like an Acapulco cliff dive. It goes straight down. Uh, not surprising, really. But that can turn around because it's psychological. And so you can push it and push it and push it and push it. But at some point, people wake up and they say, you know what? I don't have a PhD in economics. I don't know what's going on here, but I don't like it. Get me out of the dollar. Get me anything. Real estate, gold, silver, water, natural resources, yeah. a new car. Get me, get me anything. And almost overnight, when this did happen in the late 1970s, I, I lived through it, um, almost overnight, you can go from price stability or borderline disinflation to something that's highly inflationary, borderline hyperinflationary. So that, that is a loss of confidence in the dollar, which triggers a change in behavior, which triggers higher velocity, which triggers the inflation. So the, the short answer is um, it can be, uh, you know, again, if you, if you print the currency, you're not going to default on your debt, but there are many ways to default. One of them is, is not paying. That's a classic default. There's no need for that. But inflation is just another way of stealing the investor's money. It's just another kind of default. And that's the way it would play out. And it's one more reason to have gold. Great answer. Thank you for that, Jim. Um, but before we go, um, you've got a new book out. Of course, The New Great Depression, Winners and Losers. This is, uh, this is what would uh, intrigue most people and attract most people to the book, I'm sure. Winners and Losers in a post-pandemic world. Mm. Um, most people want to be a winner. Mm. 
What's, what, what does the book actually talk about, Jim? Can, can you explain that in, a, in 30 seconds? <laughs> sure. Uh, it's, uh, I had this debate with my editor and my publisher when we came up with the book idea last April. Uh, they said, Jim, you know, we, this pandemic is here. It's, we're in a deep recession. Maybe it'll get worse. Um, you're the guy on economics, and uh, we want you to write this book. Uh, and I said, okay. And I gave him an outline. I was going to talk a lot about the virus. And he said, now, hold on. You are an economist. We love you on that, but you're not a doctor. We don't really want you to write about the virus. And I said, that's like asking someone to write about property damage in New Orleans in 2005 and not mention Hurricane Katrina. I said, of course I have to mention it. Of course I have to mention it. But I said, don't worry. I, I went to Johns Hopkins. I'm not intimidated by natural science. But I did a deep dive on that. I read over 100 peer-reviewed articles from, you know, Journal of the American Medical Association, Lancet, you know, the top medical journals, including, by the way, a lot of research from Australia. Um, there's, I think, a Flinders University, but, but be that as it may, there were a lot of Australian contributors. By the way, uh, just for, for our audience here, I, I applaud Australia's integrity and bravery in uh, telling the Chinese that they need an open, impartial investigation of where the virus came from. And Australia has taken um, uh, a little bit of a bashing from China because of that, but it was the right thing to do. And I talked about that in my book and I had that evidence last um, spring, the book didn't come out until January, but we had, there, there were other printing issues associated with that. But I did a lot of the research last spring. It was clear then and more clear today that this did come from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And I'm not, I'm not saying it was intentionally leaked. I'm not saying it was a bioweapon. It was more likely than not an accidental leak but it was bioengineered for experimental purposes and probably leaked accidentally. Uh, and there's no question about China's cover-up, which was intentional, some combination of gross negligence at the start and later on intentional. And now they're spinning all these crazy theories about frozen food and all that. It's all nonsense. Um, but, uh, but Australia was right to call for an investigation, but I don't, uh, I'm not a sovereign government. I can reach my own conclusions. And again, the evidence was clear that this, this came from, uh, came from the lab. Um, so I talked about that and then, but then I have to get on with the economics. So chapter three is called the new great depression, same title as the book it kind of goes through what we've been talking about chapter four, why monetary policy will fail. And that's a lot because of the velocity we talked about and why yep. fiscal policy will fail. And that's because of the extremely high debt levels, which we also talked about chapter five, uh, is interesting because it's the most underappreciated, understudied aspect of this, which are the mental health aspects. You don't have to get COVID to be a COVID sufferer because there are serious mental health damages. We talked about that. Yes. And then my, but, then my, um, but I left out chapter two. And so let me come back to chapter two. Chapter two was the lockdown. And that's the bridge between here's the virus and the medicine. Here's the new Great Depression. What was the bridge from one to the other? And the answer is it was the lockdowns. The evidence is very clear. Lockdowns don't work. They, uh, they do not stop the spread of the virus. Politicians do them because they have to be seen to be doing something. Politicians don't know anything about what, what we're discussing right now, but they're good politicians, so they want to do so. so they lock things down. There, there are, by the way, this is not opinion. There are very large empirical studies from all over the world at this point. There were, there were some when I did the writing and some older ones from pre, pre-COVID, but um, since then, there have been studies looking at, uh, say, for example, in the United States, we have 50 states. Uh, they had all different policies. California and New York had extreme lockdowns. Florida had a moderate lockdown. South Dakota had no lockdown. The, gov the governor never locked anything down. She said, wash your hands, keep your distance, use common sense, but we're not going to tell people what to do or what not to do. Same thing around the world. Um, uh, Italy had an extreme lockdown, as did other countries. Uh, Victoria certainly did. Um, Sweden had a moderate lockdown. And there were some countries, Brazil in the early stages, that had almost no lockdown at all. So you've got um, a database of extreme, moderate, and low to no, to no lockdown. Uh, we have all the data in terms of case loads and fatalities. And guess what? There is no correlation, none, between lockdown policy and cases and fatalities. You know, in, in, in a statistical sense, there is no evidence that lockdowns have any impact, have any material impact on the spread of the virus. So, but they're really good at destroying the economy. Uh, and we've done that. <laughs> so I, so I, I, talked, I talked about that. 
And then, Chip, then my editor said, okay, Jim, you can't write a whole book on a pandemic and a depression and not have a happy ending. So I, chapter six is the happy ending where I talk to investors about what they can do. And I'll, I'll tell you a real quick story. We're, we're all familiar with the uh, German Weimar Republic hyperinflation of 1922, 1923. Everyone knows that. There was an individual and his name was Ugo Stinnes. And he was a German industrialist. He saw this coming. And he went out and borrowed massive amounts of Reichsmarks before the hyperinflation. He took the money. He, he invested in hard assets. He bought coal, steel, ships, railroads, transportation, but all hard assets. Then here comes the hyperinflation. He paid back all the debt, a good borrower. Of course, at that point, they were sweeping the currency down the sewers. So I would like to say he paid back pennies on the dollar, but there were <laughs> millions, millions of a penny on the dollar. But he paid back the debt, but he kept the assets. He became the richest man in Germany. Wow. And his nickname was, in, uh, my German is not very good, but it's inflation is called me, which means the inflation king. But Ugo Sinez became the richest man in Germany during the worst hyperinflation in the history of developed economies. So the point, the point of the story is, even in the worst environment you can think uh-huh. of, there are ways to make money, not just preserve wealth, but acquire wealth. If you see it coming and you have the right analytical tools, and that's what I talk about at the end of the book. You're right. Fantastic. Fantastic. That is the book, The New Great Depression. Yep. Uh, it sounds yep. like a fantastic read. Yep. I mean, we have read all of your books. In fact, we purchased a number of these, Jim, to uh, we've got a number of clients that keep demanding these. So uh, We have a store of books yeah. and uh, yours are in amongst them oh, uh, in, a big, in they, a big way. They head the way. Yeah. They, they, so yeah. don't, don't go to Amazon. Go to As Good As Gold <laughs> and, you, and you'll be, be able to supply the book. And as soon as I can make my way to Adelaide, uh, as soon as I can make my way to Adelaide, invite all your customers in. I'll be happy to sign them all. Oh, Roof. fantastic. Great stuff. Fantastic. Um, you better end up. Yeah, yeah. So on closing, I have one last point. Um, if any of our viewers would like to subscribe uh, to your financial newsletter, what do they do? And just quickly, what, what could they expect? Our publisher is Paradigm Press. Uh, so you can go to paradigmpress.com or just put in Jim Rickard's Paradigm Press. You'll find it very easily. Mm-hmm. Having, having said that, uh, I do, um, I'm the writer and the editor, but I do believe that I'm, I'm not sure they take uh, subscriptions outside the United States. There are some legal okay. regulatory reasons around that. However, uh, we do have uh, an affiliate in Australia. So there is um, in, in Port Phillip. So there is a, uh, uh, an Australian version of uh, strategic intelligence, which picks up a lot of my writing. So they take what I do for the U.S. audience. They 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 add their own stuff. Uh, but Shay Russell is the I probably yep. know Shay. We know Shay, yes. right? And uh, so there is a uh, there is a Jim Rickards version of strategic intelligence in Australia. Um, again, I think if you just Google my name and uh, um, maybe Port Phillip Publishing or. Uh, I, I should know more about the exact name of the publisher, but it's easy to find. It's easy to find. They're based in Melbourne. There's a it's Daily Australia. Reckoning. Uh, the Daily Reckoning is one of the yeah. publications, but yeah. there's also one uh, that has longer pieces that, that I write. So I am available in Australia, but you have to go through the Australian publisher. Thank you so much. Uh, I know that you're an incredibly busy man, and uh, we just feel rather privileged that you put aside your time this morning. Um, we've got a couple of events coming up, you know that, uh, a couple of virtual conferences, and um, we'd love to have you attend uh, one of those for sure. Um, they'll be coming up in the next two or three months, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to connecting with you again then. Uh, gee whiz. Time Thanks, Jim. Once again, your information is powerful and uh, beautifully researched, and uh, we appreciate your time. Um, to our subscribers, uh, our viewer subscribers, Thank you very much for supporting our channel. And um, for now, we would say stay well, stay focused, and goodbye for now. Goodbye for now.